Hi class. In this video, I'm going to be talking about animation using P5. We're going to be building on some of the concepts that we've looked at over the last few weeks, including variables and conditional logic to create a simple animation. In the demo, I'm just going to be working from scratch, but you can apply this animation to your meme project. So for the final version of this project, we'll create an animated meme. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to open up GitHub. Make sure I'm on my MMP210 repository and that everything's up to date. And I'm gonna click Show in Finder to open my folder. So I have my meme version one folder with my lizard image and my cat image. So I'm just gonna duplicate one of these folders so I have another copy of those assets. So I'll just duplicate the last one and change the name to meme version three. This is gonna be our last one. This is the animated meme. And then I'll grab my 210 folder and drag that over to Sublime Text to open that up. And start the Sublime server. Open up a Chrome window. Go to localhost 8080. And I haven't added the link yet, so I'm just going to type in meme version 3. And so this is the meme version that we see here. I'm going to be starting from scratch, so I'll delete that. I'm going to go to meme version three and open up sketch.js. And I'm just gonna go ahead and delete everything in here. We're gonna be starting from scratch. And I'm gonna increase the font size a bit so this is more visible. And so here's meme version three, the final version. This is the animated uh, meme and or logo. Today we're gonna look at making an animated meme. And at the end of the lesson, uh, you should be able to create the um, famous bouncing DVD logo. Um, so you guys have probably seen this before. It's, you know, from uh, an earlier media time, but it's kind of made a comeback as sort of a funny retro uh, graphics thing. Um, and so we'll be able to create uh, basically our own version of this. Um, and so your meme or logo doesn't have to use this animation, but uh, what we can see as we watch this is that the animation is changing both the position and the color um, of the logo. And so we'll look at how to do both of those things. And we can really apply animation just like a variable to anything that involves a number. Um, so just like you know, using mouse X or mouse Y, we can use animation to change the position, size, uh, color, um, and other properties. Um, anything that uses a number is pretty easy to animate. So let's go over a couple simple things. Um, I'm just gonna set up my basic uh, program. So I say function setup, and we'll do a create canvas. Uh, do 640 by 360 as usual. Um, and then I'll just do my function draw and uh, draw a background, 220, and I'll draw an ellipse at 100, 100, 100. So all just basic numbers, nothing too crazy going on here. And so when we uh, draw the ellipse, it's not moving, it's just sitting in one place, and you know it's pretty much just a simple sketch. And so what we wanna do to create an animation is change something here. There's nothing I can do uh, to the sketch without changing the code to make this ellipse move or change on the screen. If I want my ellipse to move, what I need is a variable. And so let's start by putting in a variable for our position. So we'll just start with position as a simple thing to animate. So I'll say variable x, and I'll set it to the x value of the ellipse. So I'll copy that and throw it up there. I'll put in x where that 100 was. And we can see we still have the same ellipse. Um, nothing's changed at this point. But I can change x. If I change x to 200, the position of the ellipse changes. Uh, and if I add 5 to x, I can slowly increase the position of the ellipse. And so I can do a simple increment. I can say x++. Plus plus. And I might not have talked about plus plus before, but this is essentially a shorthand for saying x equals x plus one. Okay, so what that means is, uh, you know, if x, if before this line x equals uh, 100, 
So then we're saying 100 plus 1, and then assigning that back to x. So after this line, x will be 101. And this is such a common operation in programming that they came up with a shorthand for it, which is simply x plus plus. So it's pretty slow. If you want to add more than one, you can say plus equals. So we could say plus equals 5. And now our animation will go nice and fast. Um, and so plus equals is taking the value of x, adding 5 to it, and then assigning it back to x. So let's just take out the background for a moment and just remind ourselves that when we're doing an animation or something interactive, we're actually just drawing the circle in a bunch of different places. But since we're drawing the background behind it each time, then we're covering up the previous version of the circle. And the result of that is this sort of illusion of, of movement or animation. And so we're basically painting a whole bunch of different pictures, but over time, there's ch they change, and so we see that we see that change. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, why does the circle go all the way off the other side of the screen, right? Well, there's a way that we can fix that, and we can do that using a conditional, uh, which we learned last week. And so if we want to change the behavior of x, um, when we start our program, x equals 100. So our circle is like right here. And then we're adding to it, Okay, each time we add 5, 5, 5, 5. Eventually, when this number is very big, like uh, 700 or so, the circle will be completely off this side of the screen, and we won't be able to see it anymore. And so if we want the circle to either bounce back or come out this side of the screen or, you know, do something else, we need to detect when it crosses this part of the screen. And so we can check our x value against this number here, which it, we know it's 640 because that's what we created our canvas, but we also know that that is the width because 640 gets put into this width variable when we create the canvas. So we can say if x is greater than width, so if x is greater than width, we know that the x position of the circle is past the right side of the screen, then we can reset x. We can say x equals 0. And so now we'll see the circle return to the other side of the screen. And I said 0 here. We could really say whatever number we wanted. We could set it back to 100 where it started. But I'm using 0 because I want it to appear on the other side of the screen. So let's set the origin for x back to 0. So another thing you might notice is that there's this momentary jump where it goes from you can see it to all of a sudden it's gone and then it reappears. So if we want the circle to wait until it gets completely off the screen, we actually have to account for the size of the circle, right? When our circle gets to here, when this is x, the circle draws from the center, so this part of the circle is still visible. And so if we want to wait until this part of the circle is all the way over, then we need to actually increment, then we need to actually add a little bit to the width. We can add half of the circle's width, which is 50. And likewise, on the other side, we can set x to negative 50. So now let's actually move the speed down a bit so it's easier to see. So now we can see the circle goes all the way off screen and then comes all the way back on. And we could also set it to you know negative 200 or something like that, but then there's going to be a long delay after it goes off the other side of the circle. So those numbers, you know, affect the way that the animation appears. Okay, so you might be saying, now we're moving in one direction, what about in the up and down direction? And like basically any value that you want to set as a variable, you can also animate. So we can draw an ellipse at x, y. We can say y plus equals 2. And then we can also reset y. This time we'll use height. And we'll use y here. 
So now we're going to see x change. And so this works because we can see the boundaries of the canvas. But you could also do this with the size of x. Okay, so if I had another variable s, and let's set it to 100 to start, and then set s here, we can say s plus equals 2 as well. And it's going to keep getting bigger. And if we want to reset it, we can also reset it. So we can use the exact same math. The only difference here is we want size, we don't want size to be negative, so we'll set it back to 100. But then height is just a number here. So size, as soon as it gets to be the height of the canvas, it'll go back to the beginning. So we can really choose height makes sense when we're talking about the vertical position, the y, and width makes sense when we're talking about x. For size, we can just choose a number. It doesn't really matter or, you know, whatever we think looks good. So I could choose 400. If I want the animation to happen a bit faster, I can use 200. So we can animate size, position, or any other property that uses a number. All right, so what if we want to get the DVD bouncing, DVD menu bounce off the edges? In that case, let's simplify things a bit. So I'm going to just go back to X, and I'm going to move Y down a bit so we can see it. So let's just start on the x-axis. How do we get this to bounce backwards? Well, if we, right now, x is always moving. Plus 2, plus 2, plus 2, right? x is always going in a positive direction. So when we get to here, we're just resetting x back to here. But the problem is we want to send x negative 2, negative 2 negative 2. And so we could say, okay, x plus equals negative 2. But now it just disappears, right? It just goes off the left side of the screen. Or we could say, if x is greater than width, x minus equals 2. But you might be able to guess what happens now. It's just going to go back for a second. And then it's going to get stuck because every frame it's doing plus two, it's going past width, and then it's doing minus two again. So it's basically just toggling back and forth between these two values. So what we wanna do is permanently change, or not permanently, but temporarily change the speed that we're going, okay? And then once we get back to here, we wanna change it back. So there's a good trick for this, um, and we'll show a couple different ways to do it. So we have this speed value, right? Okay, so if I want to change that number, I need to use a variable. I can't change a 2 in my program. I can add a minus in front of it if I'm coding, but once I start the program, I can't change what the code I wrote is, so I need to change it. I need a variable. So let's create a speed variable. And I'm going to actually increase it just a bit. So instead of x plus equals 2, we'll say x plus equals speed. And if we hit the other side of the canvas, we'll say speed equals negative 2. And so this is going to solve one of our problems, but it's also going to create another one. OK, so we bounced, right? We hit the other side of the canvas. And when that happens, we reverse the value of speed. And so instead of going plus 2, plus 2, plus 2, when we hit here, we change that speed value, negative 2, negative 2, negative 2, and so we reverse the direction. The problem is when we get back to here, because we just said speed equals minus 2, how do I get it to go back to 2? Well, there's a couple ways to do this. One is just to test for another condition. If x is less than 0, set speed back to 2. So that should fix our problem. We get one bounce. We get another bounce. And that's all we need, right? If we, as long as these two bounces keep working, we're good to go. So that's one way to do it. 
And if you're happy with that, you can stop there. But one thing that I want to point out is that there's a simpler mathematical way to do this. So we have two conditions, right? One, two. And they do different things technically, right? One goes to negative two, the other goes to two. But with some basic algebra, if we have two times negative one, it's negative two, right? And then if we take negative two and multiply that by negative one, it goes back to two. So what we really want to do here is just say speed equals speed times negative one. Okay, and then that's the same thing that we do down here. And if these two are the same, remembering our compound conditionals, I can combine my conditionals. So this may look like it's about to go from very simple to very complicated, but we'll do some more examples to reinforce it. So we have one condition that reverses the speed or another condition. Okay, so remember we can use the two lines to make or. So we'll go and put this here. And now we don't need the second condition at all. So let's see that work and then we'll talk about it again. So we bounce and we bounce again. So remember our or statement basically means either side can be true. So if this is true and this is false, it still runs the code. So either if x goes over the width or x is less than zero, we're going to reverse the speed. And you might be thinking, there's a shorthand for adding. Is there a shorthand for multiplying a value? Well, there is. It's just exactly how you'd think. I'm going to put the times over there. And so now we have speed times equals negative 1. So we take the value of speed, multiply it by negative 1, and assign it back to speed. Um, and I'm going to add a comment here that says hits right or left side of canvas. Okay, so we've got half of our DVD menu. So let's do the Y, right? So we can say Y plus equals speed, and then we can recreate this one. So hit top or bottom, and we just have to change X to Y, change width to height, and Y to zero. Pretty much doing all the same stuff. Uh-oh. So we got an issue here, which is what? We're relying on one speed number. And so when we hit the bottom, we're not only reversing the speed for x, we're also reversing the speed for y. And because this guy has to bounce here and then keep going, what that means is that x is plus 2, y is plus 2. But when we hit down here, x is still going to be plus 2, y is going to be negative 2. Okay, when it's going up, y is negative. So we need to separate our variables so that we can update them separately. So I'm going to change this one to x speed and variable y speed. So now I'll just use x speed. So now I'll use x speed for x, and I'll use y speed for y. Okay, we've got our animation. So now, remember, we can also change the color. And to do this, we're going to use a new value. I'm going to introduce it. I mean, we're going to use a new function. I'm going to introduce it real quick, and then we'll use it to add the color. So one thing that we can actually do to kind of make some variation here is use a little randomness. OK, so if I take the x value and I say plus random 5, you're going to see it kind of wiggles a little bit. It kind of screws up my animation, but it looks kind of cool, right? I can do the same thing on the y value. I could also just use completely random values with no reference to speed at all. Random, say, negative 10 to 10. And I'll use the same thing on y. So I can create an animation without even using a variable in this case.
So that could be useful for a lot of different reasons. But let's talk about what it is happening so we can come up with better ways to use it. So I'm going to look up P5 random. So random takes an, a number and it gives us back a random number in that range. And it takes a minimum or maximum min and max value. So if we just say like random for one, we're going to get some value between 0 and 1. If we say random for 10, we're going to get different values between 0 and 10. And with random, there's a very complex mathematical function that occurs, but it basically just spits out a random number, an unpredictable number. We can also use a range. So if I only want random numbers between 5 and 10, I can use 5 as the minimum and 10 as the maximum. And I can use negative numbers as well. And so you might be thinking, why do we need random? If you remember in the DVD uh, animation, the DVD logo changed colors every time it hit the wall. And so it might be easy to change a color, right? If we have a couple of colors, so let's set our fill. So I'm going to say fill is, um, let's say C for color. And so I'm going to say variable C equals red. Okay, so now we have a red circle. And so let's say if I hit a wall, I can change the color. So I'll say C equals purple. Okay, so when we hit the X wall, we get purple. And when I use the Y one, let's say C equals green. So now we'll get red, green, and then purple. Problem is now we're going to go back to green, back to purple. But we want to just keep throwing random colors on there. So one thing to point out is that we can make other things happen besides just changing the speed inside of our if statement. We could change the size. You know, we could do lots of different things. So I could reset the size here. I could say size equals random 200. And so now every time it hits the width, it's just going to change size. So you're not limited to just changing the speed or just changing the color. You can really change whatever you want. But with the color, we can only change it to one value. OK, so let's try changing it in a different way to get a random number. So instead of saying C equals red, I'm just going to set C to a color. I'm going to say C equals color. And let's just start it out as white, 255. And color is another function in P5 that returns a color value based on whatever we put in there. Um, so we can save a variable with an entire color inside of it, as opposed to just the red, green, or blue value. So I could also say, like, if I wanted yellow, I could say 255, 255, 0. So that way I can save all three of those numbers and not and save it all in just one variable. Let's put some comments here. Speed. Or no, that's size and color. So if we wanted to set the color to a random value, we could say variable r equals random 255. Variable g equals random 255. So I'm creating red, green, and blue. And then I could substitute these color values inside my color. And so when I say random 255, I'm creating a value between 0 and 255, which is the full range of my colors. Uh, and then I'm assigning that value in my color. So every time I refresh, I'm going to get a random color. The nice thing about this is you can also start to design your colors a little bit. Let's say I didn't want any red. I could make the red value really small 
And so now it's less likely to be red. However, if I want them always to be red, I could make my green and blue values very small. And so now it's much more likely to be red. So even though the numbers are completely random each time, I can change the amount of color that I put in so I can emphasize the red values or the green values or the blue values. So let's go back to random 255. And now if I want to change my color every time I hit a wall, I can just repeat this code. So I can grab this and put this down here. and put it down here as well. So now every time I hit the wall, I'm going to get a random color. So that's basically our DVD menu. I want to do one more example, and then we'll put in our image just to show how we can do the same thing with the image. So one thing that I want to point out is that essentially what we're doing here is just counting. Okay, and if we want to count something, we can just use another variable. Okay, so if I have like a count variable, and I set it to zero, if I want to animate my speed, but I don't want to have any relationship to everything else that's going on here, I can increase my count, I could say count plus plus. I could also use frame count for this, but you'll see why I'm making my own variable in a moment. So I can say if count equals, let's say 30, so every half second, we're gonna set a random size. And let's use like 100 to 200. So now our size is gonna change after 30 frames. So if I wanna repeat that, all I have to do is set my count back to zero. Okay, so let's console.log the count to see that happen. So it's happening really fast, but if I scroll back, I can see that count starts at one, and then it keeps going up, and then at 29, it sets back to zero, right? Because when count equals 30, we set it back to zero. And so we start counting again. And so now our size is changing independently of our speed or our color or these other animations. So essentially all of our animations are doing some version of this. The difference is that X and Y are related to the speed and the size of the canvas. And our colors are set to random numbers. So those are a few different ways that we can animate so those are a few different ways that we can animate our scenes. Keep in mind as well that we can apply these things differently. So if you want to make the color change over time rather than change automatically, you can just take these numbers and do a plus plus or plus equals speed uh, instead of uh, doing a random value when you hit the wall. Any process you can use to animate a number can be used for different values. All right, so let's add in our cat image and our text uh, just to demonstrate how to do that. Um, so the text is very easy. Uh, basically, we can just take the same code that we have for the ellipse and just replace ellipse with text and make sure to put some sort of string uh, in the first argument. Okay, so there's no size for the text, but we could uh, use that for the text size is S. It's a little too big, so maybe we'll do size over two. And then take it out of the text itself so it doesn't restrict the text. And let's also align the text in the center so it doesn't so it looks like it's animating that way so adding the text for an animation is pretty easy just changing basically that ellipse and then designing the text a little bit let's change this so it only changes every second instead of twice a second
Okay, so we can also add in our image. So I have my cat image here. Um, one thing I might want to do is like crop it or take out the background. Um, so I can do that in Photoshop pretty easily. So let's just crop the image down. I just hit C to crop. A bit. And then I have to release the background. And then I can just use the quick selection tool. So I'll just grab the quick selection tool and select the parts of the image that I want to keep. It's going a little bit over where I want, so I can use the minus to remove those parts and then bring the hardness down a bit so I can grab these edges. So I'm doing minus just by holding option. So I'll just take out these parts in here. And then this part has some pretty small detail, but I can get in there, just add that little toe. So I don't have to be perfect here, just getting most of the art. So it doesn't have to be perfect, just want to get most of my cat in here. Okay, and then I'll go to select and inverse the selection and command X. And then I can size this down a bit. So I don't need it to be super big. I'll just do like 256 pixels. So that's going to be pretty small. And then I'll just export. So it has to be a PNG. So I'll do quick export as PNG is good enough. And so I'll say cat.png and save. So that's Photoshop. If you don't have Photoshop, you can also use uh, a free program like Krita or probably find a website to do it. With Krita, it looks a little bit different. If you haven't used Krita before or Krita, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, this is a free image editing software. So I would just use the Krita interface. So it's a little different. I have to go here, go to desktop, and then go in to find my original image. And so with this one, I can use the ellipse select tool. And this one is a little bit less accurate because I'm just doing it by hand. But you can get something pretty decent. I'm just going to grab this. I'm not spending a ton of time here, but if you spend a little bit more time, you can get a more accurate cutout. So I have my selection. That's good enough. I'm going to invert the selection and erase the background. So I made a couple of mistakes here, but uh, it's good enough for what I want to do. Um, so then I'm going to invert the selection again and uh, trim uh, to the selection. So then I'll change the image size, do the same thing here, and I will uh, export. And again, make sure to choose PNG so you can have the transparency. I'm going to put a little K here just so I know the difference, and that looks fine. Um, so Krita is another good uh, free program to use if you want to edit an image. So there's the Krita version and the Photoshop version. Uh, and I use slightly different techniques, but you can use either one with either program. Neither one of them are perfect, but um, I did it pretty quickly. So whatever you want to do. And there's also some websites that will do it for you. Anyway, um, let's add in our cat image. So I'm going to create a new variable, cat image. Um, and then I have to preload my image. So I'm going to do function preload. Cat image gets load image. And I'm going to use cat.png. And so then if I want my cat to take the place of the ellipse, um, I can just say image, cat image, and then use the same variables, x, y, and size. And I'll use size for both the width and the height. It's going to distort it a little bit, but at least they'll be the same. So there I have my cat. That looks pretty good. If I want the cat and the image to be in the same place, I can use um, image mode center. 
Okay, that looks pretty good. And if I want the cat to take on the color as well, we can use tint there. So I can use the same color va variable for the tint that I used for um, the text. Okay, so again, none of these things are required, but I just wanted to go ahead and show how to do these if you're interested in creating something like that. That's it for this example. In the next video, I'm gonna be going over a new concept with P5 that we haven't done before, um, which is gonna be a bit different uh, as far as how we think about the canvas and other things like that. Um, and so I'll do a second version uh, for that one. Um, let's add in a thumbnail here. So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna wait until I see the cat and say save. That's a pretty good one. All right, so we can add in this project. Um, so I'm gonna make a new window and go to downloads and grab this uh, thumbnail.png, throw that in there. So now I have my thumbnail and I'll go over, I'll close out sketch and let's actually rename this. So this is gonna be meme3-1. So I am actually gonna do another version uh, after this. So when I go to index.html, I'm gonna do something similar here. Um, I'll add the second link later. So this is meme version 3-1 and this is 3-1 as the folder. And then I actually called this thumbnail. So let's just call this thumbnail.png. And then let's update this link as well meme version 3-1, and there we go. And so in the next one, um, we'll go over some more techniques and create another version. So I'm gonna go ahead and commit this one, and I'll go to GitHub and just say adds animated meme uh, 3-1, and commit to master, and push to origin. So that's it for this video. Uh, as usual, just let me know if you have any questions or if you get stuck with anything on email or on Discord or we can talk in class.